Uh, so thanks, Sheila, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I think we will have people coming in um, during the morning, um, but I think we're just going to press on. And I'd like to open the conference um, by presenting an overview of some of my own work in relation to uh, the field of childhood maltreatment, focusing specifically on some of the neuroscience work we have been doing um, in the Developmental Risk and Resilience Unit. So very much taking a neuroscience perspective. But I'd want to begin by emphasizing that although we're looking at neuroscience findings in particular, this really is a talk about relationships and about human relationships because the brain is exquisitely sensitive to the experience of those early relationships um, that children have within their home and throughout life. And today we're all here not just thinking about typical development and how relationships might influence all of us across our lives, but in particular about the impact of adverse early experiences, so things like neglect, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, um, and exposure to domestic violence. And we're interested in um, these influences because a series of longitudinal studies have now shown that there is a significant impact of those kind of early adverse experiences across the lifespan with a significant increase in risk of mental health problems. And one of the very striking things about these um, longitudinal studies is that, that this risk persists across the lifespan well into an individual's 30s, 40s, and 50s. So there may be something of a delay before a disorder or a set of mental health problems may emerge. So in a curious way, these vulnerabilities seem to become embedded very early on. And when they do emerge, the mental health problems appear to be less responsive to traditional treatments and forms of intervention, which in many ways aren't terribly effective anyway um, with the kinds of children um, that we have coming to our clinics with anxiety and depression and PTSD. We have ways to go in terms of improving um, the effectiveness of our treatments. And when these problems do present, they're also likely to be comorbid with other difficulties, and they tend to present with a greater level of severity. So this is rather sobering, and our current system is very much organized around tackling and helping to treat these problems when they have reached this level of clinical severity. So our treatment model very much focuses on the very end of the process where a clinical disorder has emerged, and if we're lucky, we're able to refer a child to CAMS to get some specialist, nice guideline um, supported treatment. But most of us will recognize that this orientation of the system fails many children, and it also waits often until the difficulties have become entrenched at a very um, severe level which become more difficult to treat. So what I would like to argue is for a reorientation of the treatment and service delivery of children who've experienced maltreatment. So first of all, I think we could be much better at detecting the emergence of difficulties before a full-blown disorder has emerged. So can we identify those children at most risk of later disorder much earlier in the trajectory between the experience of early adversity and poor outcome. And once we've identified those children, what would we do with them? Well, in some ways, we would need to begin a significant shift in how we think about treatment because we would be thinking about a preventative intervention. And in order to develop effective preventative interventions, we need to be able to pinpoint the specific mechanisms that are mediating the relationship between early adversity and the later poor outcome. In other words, we really need to understand how early adversity gets under the skin in ways that unfold over time to lead to a severe mental health difficulty. And finally, one thing we haven't been very good at is understanding processes associated with resilience we need to learn much more about why a significant proportion of young people who do experience maltreatment don't develop a mental health problem. Because that may provide very important clues as to how we might help intervene with those children who are more vulnerable. So I hope that over the course of this morning, we're going to really be touching on all of these topics across um, the different speakers. <clears throat> 
and to really frame some of my own work, and I think some of the um, some of the findings we're going to hear about this morning, I want to introduce something that S.C. Veeding and myself have developed as a way to try and think about this relationship between early adversity and later mental health problems. And it's something we call the theory of latent vulnerability, which is a multi-level model to try and think about this relationship, which entirely builds on Dante Cicchetti's work. And we'll be hearing, um, I'm very pleased to say, from him later um, this morning. But it's something which really has emerged from a large body of work over the last 20 years that others have carefully constructed. And this is really a, a framework for thinking about how early adversity can embed long-term risk of mental health problems. And it takes this multi-level approach, which, which Dante has completely pioneered, where we think about development not just at the psychological and behavioral levels, but also at the neuroscience and um, genetic levels. So when a child is born into an adverse environment, the idea is that that child needs to respond and adapt and cope in often a chaotic um, or uncertain or violent family um, context, and that requires sets of processes that will allow the child to respond and adapt to help them regulate their emotion and have their needs met. And what we believe is that those processes of response and adaptation can be seen at the epigenetic level, at the neurocognitive level, and at the psychological level. And um, Charlotte Cecil is going to be presenting this morning some evidence in relation to epigenetic modulation, and I'll be focusing in particular on the neurocognitive um, level. And in some ways, this is a departure from a, a rather older narrative, which talked about damage in relation to early adversity and maltreatment, because what we're learning, I think, is that what children are showing are exquisite patterns of functional adaptation to very maladaptive environments, but adaptations that make sense and that are helpful in those particular environments, but which are less helpful and incur a degree of risk across the child's lifespan. So for some children, the outcome is positive. Um, we can see that for some children, they benefit from having a series of protective factors that may promote resilience, and we believe that these particularly relate to social relationships and social protective factors, and there's a major task to really try and specify and identify those. The same children may be lucky in not having experienced re-victimization or future stressors, and they may be lucky to have a set of resilient genotypes that um, protect them from specific kinds of future adversity. But not all children will be so lucky. So some children will not have the benefit of protective social relationships or secure attachments that may help buffer and help them process some of those early traumas. They may be uh, unfortunate to be re-victimized or be exposed to other kinds of stressors such as community violence. And they may have a set of risk genotypes that make them more vulnerable to uh, exposure to future adversity. And these individuals are um, more likely to develop a mental health problem or disorder later in life. So one important thing here to realize is that there isn't a deterministic relationship here. So many children who experience maltreatment don't develop a disorder, but we really need to understand what is it that differentiates those who follow the risk versus the more resilient trajectories. So as I've said, growing up in an adverse environment can lead to a series of adaptations at multiple levels. Charlotte will talk us through some of the epigenetic um, evidence of how genes are being regulated and turned on and off. And Charlotte's very much pioneering this field um, within the UK. And as I said, I'm going to talk about neurocognitive changes and focusing very much on processes. But it's just worth bearing in mind that as clinicians, we're also interested in how a child represents the world, how a child represents their sense of self and the future um, and their relationships with others. And that's something which has been less amenable to neuroscience research, but nonetheless an important area for future work. I'm focusing particular, particularly on threat processing and autobiographical memory. And asking really how might early adversity shape these processes in ways that may have functional adaptation for the child in the short term, but which may embed latent vulnerability in the long term. So as I've said, I won't be covering the epigenetic level, but focusing instead on the neurocognitive domain. And I think we'll probably hear across um, many speakers this morning 
the ways in which early adversity can alter neurocognitive functioning that can embed um, psychiatric vulnerability in the long term. There are likely to be multiple mechanisms that embed this vulnerability. And our task as researchers is really to try and systematically evaluate and characterize each one and understand which are the best predictors of later poor mental health. So as I've said, I'm only focusing on two and starting with um, the field of threat processing. And threat processing is probably the best characterized neurocognitive domain in the field of maltreatment research. We know um, from the work of Dante and Seth Pollock that children who've experienced um, physical abuse tend to show a privileged processing of threat cues and threat faces. So they're able to identify um, a threat face with limited perceptual evidence. So on a kind of task like this, where a child is seeing a morphed face and having to identify a threat face in a sequence of a face morphing over time, we know that kids who've experienced physical abuse are better than peers at identifying very early on in that sequence that the face is likely to show um, an angry expression. This differential ability isn't evident when they process happy faces or sad faces. It seems something particularly in relation to um, the privileging of um, threat cues in their environment, which of course makes adaptive sense if you're growing up in a family characterized by physical abuse or domestic violence. But things are obviously always are not so simple, and there is also kind of a body of work that's emerging that's showing that children who've experienced um, abuse also show patterns of threat avoidance, because um, processing threat cues can be aversive and upsetting, and we believe that um, some children also engage in avoidant processing, and we know this again as clinicians when we see patterns of dissociation and um, behavioral avoidance. So we have shown, for example, in the dot probe task where children have the option of shifting their attention to a neutral versus a threat phase, that children who've experienced maltreatment tend to show a pattern of attentional avoidance. So turning their attention away from threat phases and the degree of that attentional avoidance appears to mediate the relationship between the experience of childhood maltreatment and the degree of emotional reactivity that the child presents with. So it's almost that the children who are most emotionally reactive, who have most difficulty in regulating their emotions, are the ones who most engage in this avoidant response. And Vanessa Putz, one of the postdocs in her lab, has recently investigated this pattern of avoidance in a task looking at social threat, where children were presented with um, words simply having to name the color of the words in a classic kind of Stroop paradigm. So they saw a series of words like this, which were um, completely neutral, positive words, but also socially threatening words um, such as loser and failure. And children were just naming the color of these words. And what we found um, was that children, when they were naming the color of the um, socially threatening words, showed a distributed pattern of hypoactivation and reduced activation of regions involved in kind of salience processing. And this we interpreted as an avoidant um, response to social rejection. And the more the children showed this reduced or hypoactivation of brain regions um, in response to these words, the greater the level of dissociation symptoms that they presented with. So this is a complex mix of both hypervigilance as well as avoidance that very much appears to depend on context and whether the child has the opportunity to shift their attention or whether they're forced to attend um, to, the, to the stimulus queuing threat. But we started our research um, with a very basic task, looking at the process of threat vigilance to really build on a very established body of work that had used EEG and behavioral techniques. And we used a very simple task where children simply had to say whether a face was showing an angry, um, which children simply had to indicate whether they were um, seeing a, a male face or a female face, and incidentally, we varied the expression of that face. So whether the face was showing an angry expression, neutral or sad. And what we found was that children who'd experienced either physical abuse or domestic violence at home showed increased activation of two brain regions, the amygdala and the anterior insula, 
So the amygdala, as many of you will know, is the subcortical region involved in salience processing and is particularly relevant in processing um, of, of threat cues. And the tear insula is implicated in processing bodily um, experiences that may um, harm an individual, in particular um, anticipating pain. So when children who've experienced maltreatment perceive an angry face, they're allocating greater neural um, resources to processing that face that indicate a pattern of hypervigilance and possible pain anticipation. And this signature, as it were, is very similar to the neural signature that you see in individuals who present with anxiety. And this was one of the first studies that got us thinking about this idea of latent vulnerability, because we saw, we saw a neural signature that was very similar to what you see in adult patients, but our children weren't presenting with significant levels of anxiety or significant levels um, of depression, but yet they had this neural signature which was similar to what you see in adult patients. So that made us begin to think about whether there were latent or underlying neural processes that were predisposing to a future disorder that had not yet manifest. So, to build on this first study, we wanted to investigate whether children were consciously aware of this threat, whether this was something that the child was able to perceive and had conscious awareness of, or were, was the pattern of hypervigilance something which was much less under conscious control. And in order to do this, we developed um, and used a very standard uh, dot pro paradigm that allows you to really tease apart this conscious route towards threat processing with um, a more subconscious and um, pre-attentive route to threat processing. So at the conscious level, there's a route that goes from um, the uh, thalamus all the way up through the cortex to the amygdala, where we have a conscious awareness of a threat being present. So if someone walked in with a gun, for example, it would be extremely frightening, but we would be consciously aware that that represented a threat but we are also biologically prepared for certain kinds of threats which initiate um, a kind of a threat response prior to conscious awareness. Something like this will wake us all up immediately, um, first thing, and we will jump up and we'll brush a spider you know, from our lapel or from our blouse immediately before we have conscious awareness of having perceived or processed that. And the amygdala will have already activated and triggered a behavioral response. And this subcortical route um, is something that we don't have conscious awareness of. <clears throat> the experimental task that helps us tease apart these different levels is incredibly boring. And the students and um, young people, sorry, who come and do the, the, the task for us sit in a scanner and they see a cross and a dot appears on the screen of the right or the left and they simply have to say, is the dot on the left or the right of the screen? And that's all they do for 15 minutes. And they come out of the scanner and they say, you know, really? This is it? This is all you're doing? You know, in this fancy equipment, we're just kind of looking at dots on the screen. But only after the study can we tell the young people that actually what they were seeing between the cross and the star were a set of faces. So we were able to show them um, at a subliminal level, so only for 17 milliseconds, where a child had no conscious awareness of having perceived a face, we were able to show them an angry face, um, a sad face, or in this case, a happy face or a neutral face. So we could see whether the brain was really responding to different kinds of um, emotional cues at a pre-attentive or pre-conscious level. And that is exactly what we found. So even when children had experienced maltreatment, and in this case, physical abuse and domestic violence, um, had no conscious awareness of having even seen a face, they were still showing increased activation in a brain region implicated in salience and threat processing. So this can make a lot of sense um, clinically when we think about the ways in which children become um, aroused or disturbed, often for no apparent reason, in ways that they themselves may not understand or make sense of. And I think it can help um, us as clinicians and foster carers who are um, working with these children to think about um, why they may behave in, um, and act in unpredictable ways and ways that they themselves can find perplexing um, and confusing. But if you want to think about threat processing as a, a marker 
um, of latent vulnerability, something which is predisposing to later poor mental health, we need to um, answer a number of questions. And we need to, first of all, establish that this is really something which has developed as a result of exposure to early adversity. And we still have remarkably few longitudinal studies of children who've experienced maltreatment. So when we published this study, we very much had to turn to uh, another field, and that is the study of soldiers, where it is possible to actually manipulate the exposure to adversity and measure the um, neural response to threat cues before and after exposure to combat. And that allows you to see how the brain might adapt to being in an environment characterized by threat and stress, obviously very different from the kind of experiences a child would have at home, but nonetheless a biologically threatening environment. So these were our findings, and the findings of Van Wingen and colleagues were remarkably similar. And you don't really need to be a neuroscientist to see that these were precisely the same areas. So Van Wingen and colleagues, when they measured brain response of soldiers before and after exposure to combat in Afghanistan, found only two brain regions differed, the amygdala and the anterior insula. Both of these regions showed heightened activation following the return from combat. And this was very powerful evidence that what we're seeing in children who've been exposed to adversity at home isn't any pattern of damage, but rather it's a functional adaptation associated with being in a threatening or dangerous context. And um, subsequently, we have um, been able to show that the degree of amygdala hyperactivation is to some degree calibrated depending on the severity of um, maltreatment experienced. So higher amygdala activation is associated with early age of onset of neglect. Um, Dan Lotsky and colleagues in a large longitudinal study, in a large, sorry, community study of, um, of adults self-reporting childhood trauma found that um, higher levels of childhood reported um, trauma were associated with higher levels of amygdala activation. So this suggests that those individuals who've had more childhood experiences of trauma are the ones who have calibrated amygdala reactivity to be higher, even well into adulthood. So this suggests the amygdala does calibrate in response to the degree of environmental threat. But to be a marker of latent vulnerability, amygdala activation has to predict future mental health problems. It needs to tell us something about the vulnerability that a child may have to poor mental health. And what do we know about that? Well, in children, we don't know very much because we don't have the longitudinal studies, but those are currently underway in a number of labs um, across the world. But this work has been done in relation to soldiers. So in this um, early study by Admin and colleagues, they measured the level of amygdala activation in soldiers before soldiers went into combat. And that's what you can see there um, across um, the x-axis. And higher levels of amygdala activation before combat were associated with higher levels of PTSD symptoms following combat. So the researchers were able to predict which soldiers were most likely to develop PTSD symptoms because they were the soldiers going into combat with the highest levels of amygdala activation. So this appeared to be a vulnerability factor. The higher amygdala activation didn't lead to higher PTSD symptoms in itself, but it predisposed the soldiers once they were exposed to this stress or environment to greater levels of symptomatology. And of course, you might imagine, well, what is it? Why do these... Um, Soldiers here have higher amygdala activation in the first place. Well, I would hazard a guess that they were the soldiers who may have had early experiences in childhood that were characterized by adversity or um, maltreatment that may have calibrated neural response uh, in this way. But sadly, the researchers did not look at the, so the soldiers' early experience. Another recent study has looked at a large community sample, again, looking at level of amygdala activation I'm here at time one, and then he followed up the um, symptomatology of these individuals over four years and looked at whether individuals had experienced some kind of, child, um, some kind of significant life stress during their, um, those four years. And what Hariri and colleagues found was that individuals characterized here by this red line who had high levels of amygdala activation at time one, 
were the ones who had highest levels of symptoms four years later, but only in this group who had experienced high levels of life stress. If you had high levels of amygdala activation at time one, but didn't experience significant life stress, and that's the green and yellow lines, then you didn't show increased symptomatology. So again, more evidence that you need an underlying vulnerability plus exposure to a stressor to lead to um, a future level of symptomatology. And I definitely don't need to present evidence to say that the amygdala is implicated in psychopathology because I think most of us are a little bit bored about hearing about the amygdala implicated in almost every disorder. It's implicated in depression and in anxiety and PTSD and in conduct problems, um, as well as a number of others. So we know that altered amygdala activity, which is involved in salience and threat processing, is integrally um, implicated in the pathogenesis of a range of disorders. So it appears that adaptation of the threat processing system seems to be one promising candidate of um, latent vulnerability to future disorder. And it may signal adaptive vigilance for the child within an early adverse environment, but in the longer term it may be maladaptive when the child is trying to process and um, engage in more normative and less threatening contexts. And I've begun to think about this in a way as these patterns of adaptation having both direct as well as indirect effects in terms of promoting vulnerability. So you can imagine a set of indirect effects where heightened threat processing or indeed avoidant threat processing may lead to difficulties when, a peer, uh, when an adolescent begins to establish um, peer relations during adolescence. Heightened attribution of threat, for example, may increase the risk of interpersonal conflict, um, of fights with peers, um, avoidant responses and sensitivity to social rejection may make it difficult to um, form uh, relationships with peers. And those things may in turn reduce the way in which a child or an adolescent may be able to get to garner social support um, from their peers that may moderate the impact of early adversity. But there may also be direct effects, such as reduced attentional allocation. So if an individual is allocating um, a fixed amount of their attentional resources to processing threat in their environment, well, that's going to reduce the availability of um, attentional uh, resources that they can give to more normative social and educational um, aspects of development. But I'm really just using threat processing here as one exemplar of the way in which we can try and identify a specific neurocognitive system and process that may, sh may change and adapt in response to early adversity, but embed, embed vulnerability in the longer term. Um, we're going to hear from Peter later, who's going to talk about mentalization and emotional regulation. Uh, reward processing is another promising candidate. Um, but um, I'm going to finish really by focusing um, briefly on the phenomenon of autobiographical memory is as another mechanism that we're particularly interested in as predisposing to um, mental health vulnerability. So autobiographical memory is concerned with the way in which we recollect um, our everyday experience. And memory is a crucial process for us in negotiating new experiences every day. So memories are not there for us to sit back and have a coffee you know, when we're on holiday and reminisce about things that may have happened over the year. Memory is a critical process and resource for us to negotiate challenges in our everyday lives because we extrapolate what we've learned from prior experience to help us simulate and predict the contingencies that may operate on every new experience that we have. So I've given a talk in this auditorium before, that's helpful, because you kind of, I know the space, I know um, how this um, building works, and I can draw on that to help me understand and negotiate the ways in which I can better um, perform and present to you this morning. But what happens if you have an impaired autobiographical memory that you're not able to draw on those past experiences in ways that will allow you to effectively and accurately simulate um, new eventualities in the future? Well, it seems that children who experience maltreatment have precisely this difficulty. 
They have a pattern of what we call overgeneral autobiographical memory, um, and Dante did the first study of maltreated children, which um, acted as the basis of our neuroimaging study, and found that children who experience maltreatment have a pattern of overgeneral memory where they tend not to recall specific detail, but tend to think about their past in categorical or general terms. We don't really know why, but there's a theory that children who have aversive or traumatic early memories develop an avoidant response and try to push away those difficult memories and therefore develop this very overgeneral memory um, style of recall. This overgeneral memory style is associated with adults who have depression as well as adults who have PTSD. And in an unpublished study, we have systematically invested autobiographical memory in relation to positive and negative memories, and we have replicated this finding of overgeneral memory in children. But at the neural level, we have found that when children who have experienced maltreatment recall positive memories, they tend to show reduced activation of those brain regions involved in specification of those memories. So it appears on a neural basis that less of the neural system in specifying positive memories are activated during recall. And when they recall negative memories, and these are just ordinary, everyday negative memories, nothing to do with any particularly adverse experiences, they show heightened salience activation, so of a distributed network involved in salience processing, including the amygdala. So for us, these findings of altered processing of memory suggest that this may in turn embed latent vulnerability to future disorder in two specific ways. So first of all, as I hinted to um, you at the beginning, if you have a difficulty on extrapolating from prior experience, you may be less effective in negotiating future stressors. And we know from other studies that people with higher levels of overgeneral memory are the ones who tend to have more difficulties in social problem-solving tasks. So a child who's experienced maltreatment may be less able to effectively negotiate a number of the developmental tasks and social tasks um, across development. But heightening the salience of negative memories as well as reducing the specification of positive memories may also predispose to a more um, ruminative, ruminative and negative inferential and processing style that we know is associated with disorders like depression. So again, if we think about this idea of direct and indirect effects, if you've got poorer social problem-solving skills, you may be more likely to have um, greater peer difficulties and a less cohesive um, peer group, which may reduce the level of social support that may in turn increase your vulnerability to uh, mental health problems if you're exposed to future stressors. But it may also have indirect effects, as I've said, by biasing towards the privileging of more um, negative um, material in your internal world and de-emphasizing the prioritization um, of positive memories. So just to end, I want to try and step back a little bit and think again at the very beginning what I was alluding to and what this might mean for a shift in how we're thinking about helping and um, supporting children who may have been unlucky enough to experience early adversity or maltreatment. So what we have been finding, and others in the field have been finding, is that children who are not presenting with a full-blown clinical disorder and who aren't presenting with any symptoms that are reaching clinical threshold are presenting with what we call latent vulnerabilities across multiple domains that index that they are on this trajectory of risk. They haven't presented with a disorder, but they're presenting with epigenetic and neurocognitive signatures that signal they are vulnerable but what we've seen is that that vulnerability is not deterministic. A child is likely to need um, a future exposure to a stressor, and other factors may mediate that. So the exposure of such a stressor or developmental challenges that can arise during adolescence, for example, may lead to the development of, full, of a full-blown clinical disorder which at the moment we, we try to treat, and we send children to CAMS, and when they have got these difficulties, we've seen that they're already potentially quite entrenched and comorbid and severe. But it raises the question of why we're really not shifting our focus and attention much earlier in this risk trajectory, because to do so, we need to be able to identify 
what those latent vulnerabilities are, we need to develop a clinical tool that will allow us to screen those children at most risk, and if we've managed to identify those children, can we identify and develop a preventative intervention that is being informed by our understanding of the mechanisms that underpin vulnerability, and offer a preventative intervention earlier on in the process that reduce the risk of a disorder emerging in the first place. And I'd really want to emphasize that this kind of preventative intervention is going to have nothing to do with any kind of biological or medical intervention. These difficulties have emerged as a result of maladaptive social interactions, and they will be solved by adaptive and supportive social interactions. So what we're learning from neuroscience is going to help us, I believe, in refining our understanding of the mechanisms and the ways in which we might improve our understanding of preventative interventions. But this is going to be a long-term process, and at the, at the moment, we're really at the beginning, I think, of quite a long journey. So to summarize, um, I would say that our theory of latent vulnerability has provided a framework to think about the ways in which early adversity can calibrate epigenetic and neurocognitive systems in ways that may reflect adaptation to a child's early environment, but which can embed long-term risk and vulnerability. And we've seen evidence from both the threat processing domain and the autobiographical memory processing domain, and these both direct and indirect effects. And we need to systematically investigate changes in these systems and multiple other systems in order to establish whether they truly represent markers of vulnerability that predict future risk, and can that in turn help us develop a screening tool that any frontline clinician or worker could use to identify a child at most risk of future um, difficulty. And that's going to be a long-term task over the next five or 10 years, and it's a task that we and others um, are engaged in doing. But we also need to understand whether targeting these systems through preventative social interventions can help um, recalibrate these systems in a way that can promote resilience. So we need to understand the mechanisms that underpin the vulnerability, not simply just have a screening tool that allows us to identify risk. So I'm going to finish there, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes left for questions, but I just want to thank everybody, um, all the children and families, who have really generously contributed to our research. Um, S.E. Veeding, who I co-direct the Developmental Risk and Resilience Unit, and our students and um, staff there. ESRC for funding and the work, and the Anna Freud Centre for supporting my own work across multiple domains across my career. Thank you very much. <laughs>